You don't know how glad I am to be standing today. I've been sick the last day or so, so it's so good to be uh, well and good to be bef standing before you today. I'm so honored to be able to share with you today in the spirit of transparency and full disclosure. Let me say that although the title doctor before my name sounds really good, I like that. Boy, thank you so much. It's a little bit preliminary. I still have a dissertation to finish, so for now it's just David. Later it can be doctor. I thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, being flexible. Thank you, Dr. Lee and uh, the event planners who were flexible working around my sickness. Don't worry, I don't have fever. I don't think I'm contagious anymore. Um, I'll, I do have passion for sharing, so sometimes I spit when I talk, so I'll try not to spit too far. <laughs> so thank you so much for being flexible with me and uh, with the situation that I had. I've been looking forward to this time. Uh, actually, I have been uh, on a few occasions meeting with our OSB team and planning this event. It's been exciting to plan it. To look forward to it and I am so grateful to be a part of this these few days by the way those of you who know Robert and Diana Clark I was talking with them via email this morning they say how much they love you and how much they miss you and how bad they wish they could be here this week but they are praying for us as we continue our National Congress and as we continue the work of missions here in the Philippines and around the world. Well, when, um, when Cindy, my wife, saw my topic for today, oh, is it on? Can you, if you can go ahead and turn the, oh, you're waiting for me. Oops. There we go. Can't, well, it looked really pretty on my computer screen. Maybe you can read it. When, when my wife saw my, saw my topic, um, six ways to equip church members as world Christians, she said, I hope they don't misunderstand and think you mean worldly Christians. No, I don't mean worldly Christians. I mean world Christians. Dr. Ed mentioned the term in his uh, sermon um, Wednesday night. We're talking about world Christians. Hand in hand to reach the world starts in the local church. That's where it starts. And it begins with us pastors and leaders in the local church developing every church member as a world Christian. And here's, here's what we mean by a world Christian. A world Christian is a fully devoted follower of Jesus who characterizes six Christ-like qualities. A devotion to prayer and God's word. A global view of the world. A sensitivity to cultural differences. A willingness to cross barriers. A commitment to making disciples. And a readiness to share the gospel. This is our goal for every member of IBC Manila. And we tell them from the very beginning, when they become a part of our church family, we are very honest with them, and tell them that our design, our goal for their lives is to be much more than a person who attends a worship service on Sunday morning, sits in a pew, sings some wonderful worship and praise songs together, hear a sermon, and go home. That will never reach the world. That is not hand in hand through the church. We want to develop each member of our church to be a world Christian. So what I plan to do with you this morning is to share with you some very simple ways that we can develop our church members as world Christians. Now, these six ways are not like uh, six keys that fell down from heaven into my lap. 
No, they are six simple strategies. You see them in your book there. They are, these are six simple strategies that missionaries and pastors for a long time have been using to develop individual believers to be world Christians, to be global, to be disciple makers. I, I appreciate people who are inventors. I'm not an inventor. I'm an innovator. And I challenge and encourage all of us to be innovators, to take time-tested principles and to innovate them in our local context. So what I want to share with you is ways that we can innovate these six principles, these six strategies to create in our churches a culture of mission. Let me pray before we start talking about this. Lord God, through technology, the world is not so big anymore. We simply turn on our television or log on to the internet and the world is on the screen before our eyes. And perhaps more than any other time in the history of humankind on this planet, we recognize the deep need for Christ in our world. We recognize the deep need for men and women to share the gospel in a lost world. The critical needs in our world, although can in a way be met by social workers and others who meet the um, physical needs of the world around us. Though these great needs in our world might be reached through peaceful ventures by political leaders, the only thing that will truly, the only people that can truly reach this world are people of the gospel. And so we ask that you would use these moments to train our hearts toward the world of spiritual need. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We had only been in the Philippines a few days, literally just a few days. It was, it was a sunny, hot afternoon, and I was walking from our parsonage, from our house, the church parsonage where we live, to the church campus. It's not far, only about a 15-minute walk, but my Americano body was not used to the heat and the humidity, and it was hot, so bright in it so very hot. I was wondering if I should find the taxi and go the rest of the way. But my male pride spoke up and said, no, you can do it, it's only 10 more minutes. So I continued to walk. I passed by a business on Jupiter Street on my way and there were two security guards outside on the uh, sidewalk smoking cigarettes and um, as I passed by, I, I heard a voice. Sanka pupuntaka, san santaka pupuntako. I kept on trudging along. They, they must have seen my struggle. I, I mean, it was pretty obvious. Sweat was dripping off my chin. My s shirt was soaked. I was walking very slowly. I hear this voice. Sanka pupuntako. Sanka pupuntapo. I turn, I gestured, me? Because I had no clue what he was saying. Did I, did I tell you we had just been there about three days? I had no idea what he was saying to me. I said, me? He gestured. Sanka pupuntapo. I said, I'm sorry. I'm an American, as if he didn't know. I'm an American. 
I've only been here in the Philippines a few days. I didn't say this, but I'm thinking in my mind, we did not come here with the IMB, so our language school is on the job, on the streets as we're learning. I'd only been there three days. I had no clue what he was saying. So I said, I don't understand. I haven't learned your language yet. What are you saying? And he said, where are you going, sir? I said, oh, okay. Okay. Pupunta, going. Oh, quick learner you are, sir. Yes. I said, okay, um, how do I say I'm going to my church? He said, is that where you're going? And I said, yes, that's where I'm going. And he said, oh, okay, ingat. Oh, ingat, church? <laughs> he, he, like you, he laughed, oh, no, it means take care. Oh, okay. So I'm waiting. How I say I'm going to my church, he must have had nose, nosebleed, maybe. He immediately turned to his partner. They put out their cigarettes. They walked into the building, and I'm left standing there wondering, how do I say I'm going to my church? I didn't think much about that conversation until I was preparing for this conference and what God would want me to say. As I was preparing, God brought back to mind that conversation. And I listened to that security guard's voice in my mind, and it was almost as if I heard God speaking to me. Sanka pupunta. It's a very good question. I'll ask you. Sanka pupunta. How we answer that question says a great deal about our life as followers of Jesus. It might be a good idea to ask that question very often in our churches. San Sila Pupunta. Where are they going? When they leave our campus on Sunday, where are they going? They're going so many places. But are they going in the right direction? And are they going with a mission? You see, as followers of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, go is the ultimate direction of our lives. It's the ultimate direction of our lives. Ang panghuli direksyon ng ating buhay. Go is God's favorite word. What did God say to Abraham? He said, go to a land I will show you. What did God say to Moses? He said, go back to Egypt and be the deliverer of my people from the Pharaoh. What did God say to Isaiah? He said to Isaiah, go and tell my people. What did God say to Jonah? Go to that great city of Nineveh. What did God say to Peter? Go to Caesarea and see a man named Cornelius. What did God say to Paul and Barnabas and Silas and all those men and women in the book of Acts? Go. And what did the Father say to the Son? Go. 
Go is such a common word in Scripture that we almost have to purposely ignore it. Sanka tu punta. San silap tu punta. Santayo tu punta. Sadly, many of our church members and I will be honest to say even some pastors in the world are not sure how to answer the question. It's very clear in John 17, 14 to 19, I'll go back to that slide, that we are to be in the world. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sake. I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. Go is the ultimate direction of our lives. So how can we build this culture of going in the individual hearts of our people? How can we become a going church? learn. People need to learn. You see three things so far that they need to learn. In order for we as pastors and teachers to do our job of creating a culture of going, a culture of mission in our church, we have to see that our primary responsibility is that of equippers, of teachers. The scriptures say that, that the Holy Spirit gave to the church pastors and teachers for the equipping of the body of Christ for the ministry of the church. By the way, let me say this. In this with this idea of going and seeing the world, I remember as a college student reading a little book called Out of the Salt Shaker Into the World by Rebecca Manley Pippert. Perhaps you've read that book. As I read that book as a college student, I was literally changed overnight. I read the book overnight. I was at a, at a missions conference in New Mexico as a college student. I read the book overnight, and literally overnight, God changed my perspective of the world. A little later, we're going to go to lunch, and some of us may take the salt shaker and add flavor to our food. But the salt will never add flavor to our food as long as it's in the shaker. We must turn the shaker and shake it. We can never reach the world if we are staying in the shaker. We must be in the the world. And we need to teach that to our church members. First of all, they need to learn God's Word. I know that your surprise, maybe, are not particularly impressed that I mentioned this as what people need to learn, but it's actually true. And it's actually a huge need in our churches. I'm sure it's not the case in any of our SB churches, but I know for a fact in many churches around the world, people gather in an auditorium and a pastor stands behind the pulpit and what the people hear is a good story, a funny joke, a man's or a woman's opinion about the Bible, but rarely do they hear the real, true word of God. You cannot build a missionary culture in your church if you focus on entertaining the people from the pulpit. We must focus on preaching and teaching God's Word, and we must focus on training good Bible study leaders who will teach God's people in small groups the Word of God. 
and people need to learn how to study God's Word. You've probably heard the African proverb, I almost hate to mention it today, it's, it's, it's so used, it's almost overused, but you've probably heard the African proverb, and actually I've heard some say it's an Asian proverb, and I've heard some say it's this proverb, it seems to be a proverb that's sort of universal. Give a man a fish, and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. That's our work as pastor, teachers, equippers. We don't just give people fish. We teach them how to fish. Unfortunately, too many people are content to wait an entire week for their pastor to feed them the fish he caught during the week. As pastors and leaders, we need to teach people how to study God's Word because we will never become world Christians if we do not know how to study God's Word, how to feed ourselves. Now, let me just take a little side trip here. I didn't plan on talking about this, but uh, at IBC Manila, we are preaching through the book of Acts right now. This coming Sunday, we start Acts chapter 13, which is a huge turning point in the book of Acts. In the first 12 chapters, the main characters are, are, our main character is Peter, and the focus of the gospel are Jews and Hellenistic Jews. So it's, it's the synagogue. But starting at chapter 13, the gospel direction takes a turn, and now Paul and Barnabas and Silas are the main characters, and the, and the direction of the, of the gospel is now to the Gentiles. Jesus did say that you will take the gospel to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. We see it coming true. In the first verse of chapter 13 in the book of Acts, Luke simply says this, In the church of Antioch there were prophets and teachers, and he names five of those prophets and teachers. It's fairly obvious from the Greek language because of the participles in that verse that Luke was saying that these are men who, have the, who are prophets and these are the men who were teachers. That has to happen in the local church. We have, a under, we have a misunderstanding of the word prophet. And let me just stop here and say, sorry, IBC people, you hear some of this Sunday, but twice as good. We have, we have such a misunderstanding of prophet. In some circles, a prophet is someone who, who treats God like a crystal ball. And we see the future. In some circles, a prophet is someone who has some sort of mystic, someone who has sort of like a, a trance-like connection to God. They, they speak a, a word to an individual. We've, we've lost the meaning of the word. The word prophet is a complex word in the Greek language. Pro, ephemi. Pro means what has been spoken before. Ephemi means to speak in order to illuminate. In the biblical context, what was spoken before? The Word of God. So a prophet is one who takes the Word of God and speaks in such a way that people have an aha moment. They see. It's like, it's like looking over the landscape, and it's a very cloudy, misty day, and you can't see the details of the landscape, and then the sun comes from behind the cloud and illuminates the landscape, and you say, ah, I see it now. Malabo sa claro, unclear to clear.
teaching, we so misunderstand that role. The common understanding of a, a teacher, of teaching, is that it's someone who feeds people information. And a student is someone who hears the information and stores it in their brain. And when it comes time for the test, the most of that I can regurgitate, repeat to the professor with the most accuracy, the better grade I get. And learning has occurred, so we think. But as long as the Word of God is not preached and declared in such a way that we do not have an aha moment, as long as we treat teaching and learning as simply putting information in the gray matter of a person's brain, we will never develop world Christians, we will never reach the world with the gospel message. The Word of God must come, must go from here to here. There must be prophets and teachers in the church working together to teach people the message of God so that it not only goes into the gray matter of the brain, but penetrates the heart, so that we develop people who are oriented by God's Word. God's Word must become the orientation of our lives. What do I mean by that? It affects everything about me. It affects what I think. It affects my ideas, my values. It reshapes my priorities. It, it moves from my head to my heart, and like the heart pumps blood, it goes throughout my whole system so that I'm a head-to-toe follower of Jesus, understanding with my head, believing in my heart, and living it out. We become an incarnation of the Word of God. That's what really being Christ-like means. Just as Christ is the incarnation of God, the Word become flesh, we must flesh out the Word of God to a people who are watching and observing and waiting and hoping to know that there really is something significant about following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we must, must not only declare God's Word, we must not only give people an aha moment, and we must not, as teachers, help people to, to see the Word as something that is practically lived out in our daily lives, but we must teach them how to study God's Word and find those personal applications and practical livabilities of God's Word in our lives. We need to teach people how to study God's Word. People also need to learn missions. When I was a, a little boy growing up in the U.S., we had a wonderful thing in our churches called RAs, Royal Ambassadors, and GAs, Girls Auxiliary. Southern Baptist churches excelled in missions education, especially for children. And what that did for me as a young boy was to develop a global awareness my world did not simply consist of the farmland around the home where I live, but it included many, many places. Places that my feet had never touched, but in my imagination, I had been there. I'm afraid we've lost that edge in our churches. So pastors, leaders, WMU, I want to challenge you to find ways to provide missions education, not just for the children, but for our, all of our church members. What do they need to learn about missions? They need to learn Missio Dei. They need to understand that this mission belongs to God. It doesn't belong to a missionary. It doesn't belong to a missions organization. It does not belong to a pastor. It does not belong to me. It is God's mission. This is his mission. And he's been a missionary God from the very beginning. If we truly believe what Moses wrote in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. then we understand that 
everything starts with God. In the beginning, God doesn't just describe the creation account. In the beginning, God reminds us that everything starts with God. Missions starts with God. We see it in the very first story about humankind. Here they are in the Garden of Eden. A perfect place. Perfect climate, perfect everything. God says to Adam and Eve, enjoy yourselves. And he only gave them one restriction. Only one forbidden thing. Don't eat this fruit. Only one. Now, we would think that if we had been there, correct? If I had been there, I think I could avoid one thing. But no. Like all of us, Adam and Eve, even though they had one thing not to touch, only one, they rebelled. So later in the story, later in the cool evening of the day, when God goes to the garden as was his customary pattern to have fellowship with Adam and Eve, as God walks into the garden and we hear him call out, Adam, Adam, where are you? It's not like God had lost them. It's not like God was trying to find out where they were. We heard a story from our, uh, our youngest daughter yesterday that uh, she looked in the little monitor that shows the three-year-old's bedroom, and she was not in the bed. And they, they went into the bedroom, and she wasn't anywhere in the bedroom. They searched all over the house, couldn't find her called out to her, Phoebe, Phoebe, where are you? Couldn't find her. They began to panic. Where is our daughter? My daughter went back to her bedroom, and there was Phoebe hiding under the pillows. It's not like God had lost them. It's not like God didn't know where they were. God is asking a question, Adam, where are you? So Adam would confess where he was. We hear in God's voice calling out for Adam, where are you? We hear in that voice a missionary God. And from that story to the very culmination of God's missionary history in the world, we see a missionary God setting apart missionary people, a particular people for a universal good. We need to teach our people that principle. God is on mission. This is his mission. And believe it or not, he has offered us the opportunity. Can you believe this? He has offered us the opportunity to partner with him in his mission enterprise. We also need to teach our people mission stories. One of the best ways to inspire mission culture in our church is to invite missionaries to come to your church and tell their stories. Tomorrow, Shane and Guitar will share our Sunday. Shane and Guitar will share their story at our church. It's so important for people to see missions with a face. And there are plenty of places on the internet IMB, other places, Joshua Project, are full of stories that we can download from the internet and show to our people. But don't forget the stories right there in your own church community. I'm sure there are people in your community who are on mission for God. Give them opportunities to share their stories to your congregation. They also need to learn the gospel. Really? People in our churches need to learn the gospel? Weren't they saved when they heard the gospel? Yes, they were all saved when they heard the gospel, but unfortunately, many people in our churches really don't understand 
all the implications of the gospel. And many people in our church don't understand how to share the gospel. And many people don't understand the most powerful way to present the gospel is through their life. The gospel is not simply something we say. The gospel is something we live. It's who we are. And so we need to teach people the gospel. So we have a lot to learn. And we as pastors are the primary persons responsible for teaching the people in our church how to be a world Christian. Well, we also need to pray. Look at this verse in chapter 12, verse 5, Acts. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The old theologian F.B. Meyer said that the word but here is an eloquent but. It gives a sharp contrast. I know that we pray in our church, but are we really praying as this early church in Acts? A church with the mission culture leads the people in opportunities to pray for missions. So let me just share with you just a few ways that we engage people at IBC Manila in praying for missions. How many of you have a, a midweek do you have a midweek prayer service? Not everyone does. We, it's difficult, but some of us do. We have a, th okay, thank you. We have a, even though we're a, 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 a city church and people live all over the place in Metro Manila, we still have a, a midweek uh, service every Wednesday night. We call it interconnections. And three things happen at that midweek service. First of all, there's food and fellowship. We're Baptists, right? Okay. We have food and fellowship. And then our prayer coordinator, who happens to be my wife, Cindy, leads us to pray. And we pray for three things. We pray for the local body. We pray for lost people. And we pray for missions and missionaries and unreached people groups. We strategize that time for, those, for that prayer. And we also have a time of Bible study as well. But the center focus of our meeting on Wednesday nights is a partnership of, of God's Word and prayer, including missions. Once a month on Wednesday night, we have a global missions prayer night. And so we gather at our church, we of course have the food and fellowship, but then we focus the rest of the evening and we teach people four unreached people groups. And we teach people the culture of that people group. We teach people the barriers of taking the gospel and receiving the gospel in that people group. We show them stories of missionaries and churches who are reaching the people in that people group, how they're doing it and the struggles and the challenges and the dangers and the risks they face. And then we spend time praying for each one of those people groups and we give them a little prayer guide that they take home with them to pray for those unreached people groups all during the month. And then every Sunday in our bulletin, we have a portion of our bulletin that lists another unreached people group, and we encourage people to pray also for them during the week. We must develop a prayer culture in our churches in which we're not just praying, as someone said earlier this week, not just praying for us, but praying for the world. And let me just share with you from this verse in Acts chapter, or chapter 12, verse 5, some very important principles. You know the story. You know that Peter was in prison. And you know how he was miraculously rescued from prison. An angel came and rescued Peter out of the prison. But there's something very important about this verse and about the people praying that I want to bring out to you as we talk a little bit more about prayer. It's, it's this word earnestly. That's an interesting word in the biblical language. This word in the Greek language is actually an onomatopoeia. In other words, the Greek word sounds like the real thing. And here's the real thing. It describes a bubbling, boiling over pot. So picture a pot on a fire. 
and the contents of that fire bubbling and boiling over the sides. Or another way to put it is a steaming teapot. We put the, the water on the fire and the, and the water boils and sooner or later we hear the whistle of the steam coming out of the vent. That's the word. What it pictures is intensity in our praying. The church prayed with intensity. The prayer was a desperate prayer that was boiling out of a passionate heart. And that must be our prayer. We must have the passion of God's missionary zeal boiling over in our hearts and pouring out as a heart cry to God for the lostness of this world and people in the field who are risking and daring and sacrificing to share the gospel in hard, hard places. The word also pictures consistency or in other words, the, the church was praying cons consistently. They didn't just gather for that one little prayer meeting and pray for Peter. The implication is that they were praying every day, all the time, while Peter was in prison. And Peter was in prison seven days. So while Peter is in prison, the people are praying consistently in community. It's important that we teach our people how to pray privately, but there's something about the community of God's people praying together with much intensity and consistency, praying for the Lord, to the Lord, for the needs of the world. But there's one more thing, something else that happens when we pray. You know the story. What happened? When the angel came into the prison and said to Peter, get up, by the way, Peter was sleeping. I don't know about you, this is the seventh night. The next day, Peter knows fairly sure that he's going to be executed. And it says that Peter was sleeping, chained to two guards. Oh, well, what a picture of peace and calm and security. So when the angel entered the room, it says there was a bright light it's the glory of God shining in the room. Peter was so sound asleep, that didn't wake him up. So the angel had to walk over and poke him in the side. Gising, gising, wake up, wake up. Taratayo, let's go. And the scripture says that the chains fell off. Wow. When the people of God pray with intensity, consistently, and as a community, we can depend on God's powerful activity. Chains fall off. Wow. Chains fall off of our hearts when we pray like this. The chains that bind us to our little world, what we want, what we desire, those chains fall off. Chains fall off the people where our missionaries are serving. The barriers are broken. Chains fall off as they listen and respond to the good news of Christ. I cannot emphasize this point enough. When you read the book of Acts, it becomes very clear. Two things become very clear. That the gospel cannot advance without the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. And that the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit comes upon God's people who are praying with intensity, consistently, in community. Is that true of us? We must pray. We must give people an opportunity to pray. Chains will fall off barriers to taking the gospel. Chains will fall off the lost whose hands are bound to false gods, chains will fall off of reluctant hearts whom God is calling to missions. When God's people pray, chains fall off 
and the Holy Spirit will inspire a culture of world Christians in our churches who are empowered and ready to share the gospel to a lost world. For the sake of time, let me, also, let me say just a few words about sending. We've heard quite a lot. We need to send support. We need to teach our people how to send support. Support comes in many ways. We've heard and we'll hear more this afternoon about how to send financial support. But we also need to send encouragement. About two times a year, Cindy and I receive a, a, a Balik Bayan box from a small group in a church in Hawaii. They send us food, American food that we cannot buy in the Philippines. They usually send us a few clothing items, some very practical things like toothpaste and shampoo. They know that we can get toothpaste and shampoo here in the Philippines, but they want us to know that we are not forgotten. I cannot tell you how encouraging it is to receive that box. The cost of shipping the box is probably more than the cost of the contents in the box, but it's so, it's so priceless to us. Send encouragement to missionaries. A good friend of ours who was a missionary for a long, long time in West Africa tells us the story of a time when she was so frustrated. She was so discouraged. She was so angry even. She had been working in this village for so long and there seemed to be no fruit. She was ready to quit and go back to America. And then one day, a letter came. She looked at the return address, and it was from a, a place in the U.S. she had never been, from a person she did not know. What is this? She opened it up, and it was a letter from a youth Sunday school class in the U.S. It had two sentences. Thank you for obeying God and being a missionary. We prayed for you today. She did not quit. She stayed the course because of that one simple letter from a group of teenagers who had never met her. They just saw her name on a list of missionaries to West Africa. One of the best ways to build a mission culture in your church is to lead people to send encouragement to those on the field. You talk about networking and partnering. What a fantastic way to involve our people in partnering in missions. Send a letter, send an email, send a text message, send a box of polvoron, send anything. Send encouragement. Very quickly, there's the principle of welcome. What this means is that the world is coming to our streets. Philippines, yes, it's more fun in the Philippines. It's more fun in the Philippines. And so people are coming from all over the world to see the Philippines, to see our beautiful land, to experience our beautiful people, to enjoy the Philippines. And also, since the Philippines is a, is a bridge between East and West, many companies from Asia and from the U.S. and the West and other places are putting businesses in the Philippines. And so people are coming to us from all over the world. They're in our streets, they're in our condos, they're on our seashores, they're in our resorts and businesses. Have you ever thought about developing a team in your church who will find ways to reach out, serve, and minister to expats and foreign tourists? That is one way that we can build a mission culture. I know, I know, I know that we Filipo Filipinos are, are very welcoming and friendly. That's a fact. But when we get into a routine of attending a church 
every week, same church every week, same faces, same people. They go to the same market every week, same people, same fish. We, well, not the same fish. We, we, see this, we see the same people day after day. If we're not careful, we will become a little bit neglectful and perhaps even uncomfortable with foreigners. Think about the opportunities God has given us to be world Christians without ever leaving our familiar places. There are a number of passages in the Old Testament that command God's people to show kindness to the foreigner among them. In fact, one of the beauties of the Sabbath day was that it gave the aliens, the foreigners among them, the opportunity to glean from the wheat field. So how are we as churches building a mission culture in which we are so intentional as world Christians that we reach out to the foreign faces right there in our very midst? And that's a wonderful way to get church members engaged in world missions. Some people don't have the resources to go across the sea. But if we can see the world right here, we can minister and reach out to them. One more strategy I'll talk about is mobilize. And these are five steps in mobilizing our members as world Christians. We help them find their shape for ministry and missions. Now, once again, this is not my creation. I learned it from, well, I forgot where I learned it. Uh, servant leadership. Uh, uh, I can't think of his name right now, but this, this will help us. So help people discover their spiritual gifts. Every, the Holy Spirit has given, given every follower of Christ a spiritual gift. So help people discover their spiritual gifts and how to use them in ministry and mission. And then help them to discover their heart for the world. Every person has a passion. So help people discover how their passion their heart can be connected to the, the world of need. Assist your church members to strengthen their abilities. God gives us skills and talents and abilities. Help them to strengthen those abilities to be used as a, as a way to minister and to serve in missions. Encourage your church members to understand their individual and unique personality. It is important that people on mission know themselves so they can effectively reach others. For example, how do I respond to stress? Am I comfortable or uncomfortable with things that are different or strange? Am I outgoing or am I reserved and quiet? You see, God uses our personalities in unique and specific ways when we are willing to be world Christians. And then provide a variety of experiences on-the-job training, experiences that will give church members opportunities to participate in missions and to practice what they are learning. These steps take planning and they take preparation and they take a lot of hard work, but they are worth it in helping people find their shape for ministry and mission. And we will be on our way mobilizing world Christians in our communities. And let me end here. I think the year was 1968. <coughs> Excuse me. 1968, I think, I think that was a year when NASA in the U.S. Uh, sent a, an Apollo craft for the first shot to the moon. Now, I know many of you here are not old enough remember that but I'm a senior missionary so I remember that I remember that NASA Apollo mission the first spacecraft to go to the moon they didn't land in this trip they just simply orbited around the moon and and took some photographs and, and one night I remember on the on NBC Nightly News, we were watching the, the astronauts were going to come around the back side of the moon, and when they came around the back side of the moon, they turned their camera from the moon to the earth. Wow. Amazing. 
here was this beautiful blue gym in a black velvet space. We were all just stunned to see us <laughs> from so far away. That photograph was published in many magazines. I think it was in Life magazine the next month. There's a very famous photograph. Google it on, on the internet if you've not seen it before. That planet, the Earth, our, our planet, beautiful. It's the first time we had seen the Earth from space. The story is that during that broadcast of this moonshot, when the camera turned and we saw Earth from space perspective. The story is that Billy Graham and many other missiologists were, had met in Lausanne, Switzerland, and they had stopped what they were doing to watch this exciting telecast. And when the ta camera turned and we saw that planet in space, it is said that Billy Graham said these words, Oh, God. It's so small. It's like we could just reach out and take it. Now I know that when we consider the billions of people who have never surrendered their lives to Jesus, when we consider the billions of people who have never even heard the gospel message. And more to home, when I consider this huge city to which God has called my wife and I to serve, 24 million people, the fifth largest, most densely populated city in the world. I look at my city and I see <laughs> so many people. It seems like such a huge task. But when we look at the task from God's perspective, when we see the task in the context of God's power, we can agree with Billy Graham. Oh, God, it's so small. Let's reach out and take it, shall we? God, we are just amazed that this huge task of reaching the world has been shared with us. Together with passion for the world that boils and steams out of our hearts, we pray for an outpouring of your Spirit upon your people and your churches. We pray that you will give us a global perspective of the task and see that by your power, by your indwelling spirit, we can reach out and take this world for the kingdom of God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.